So, ladies and gentlemen, it is Wednesday. And on Wednesdays, we do like to interview some traders, talk to some people, learn some new things, grow our minds, grow our belief systems, grow ourselves, and therefore grow our bank accounts. And I have a gentleman that I'm meeting for the first time today. He was referred to me by a really good friend in Australia. And I want to uh, just learn more about this gentleman. So, and I want to introduce to you on the show, Mr. Uh, Dr. Daniel Crosby. Is that correct? Is it Dr. Daniel Crosby? That's right. Good to be here. Oh, thanks for being here, man. So what's, uh, what's the doctorate for? Uh, PhD in psychology. Love it. Oh, this is gonna be the best chat ever then. <laughs> I'm super excited. Do you know a lot about the markets, Dan? Are you an active trader? Or are you just a specialist in psychology and the belief systems? So I'm a specialist in behavioral finance. I wouldn't characterize my, I'm an active investor, but I'm, I'm pretty long-term investor. Wouldn't characterize myself as a trader, but yeah, no, uh, know a lot about behavioral finance, at least I uh, hope so. That's kind of my, my job. So yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Behavioral finance. How'd you get into that? So um, I got into, you know, a PhD program in psych. I was studying to be a clinician, so basically a therapist, and uh, didn't like it. So, you know, about halfway through my uh, doctoral degree, I, you know, I said, I love thinking about why people do the things that they do, uh, but I don't want to do it sort of in this setting. And so I looked for other applications of psychology. My dad's a financial uh, professional. And he said, look, son, there's a lot of psych in the market. And uh, sure enough, lo and behold, there is a lot of psychology in the market. And here we are. That is too cool. I mean, that, that's all the market is in essence, right? Just psychology, people wanting to win, not wanting to lose, scared and excited and just a blend of all of it, right? Yeah, well, and we're talking about that on a day when it's uh, probably uh, never, never more true than it is today, you know, the day after an election. Yep. Agreed. 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 A lot of wildness going on with it, uh, out there. And so you have a book called The Behavioral Investor. I do. Which I have not read yet, and I'm ordering it on my phone right now. Um, I'm going to pull that up on the video. So tell us a little bit about that book. What's, what's the kind of the main overall point? So, yeah, so the, the behavioral investor was really looking at, uh, you know, investing behavior from a psychological, physiological, sociological perspective. So, you know, trying to get at why the things, why we do the things that we do from sort of a holistic perspective. Um, and so, you know, went into everything from, you know, what we eat to how we sleep to, you know, how we're wired as, as men and women and, you know, everything sort of soup to nuts that goes into you being, uh, you know, a good investor or a bad investor. So I thought that that was kind of a gap in the behavioral finance literature. So I wanted to take it on. Love it, man. Thank you. Thank you for creating that. Um, I'm working on a uh, psychology program right now. So I, I need to make sure I crush some of your content to learn a little bit more about it. What was your biggest takeaway as writing that book, Dr. Crosby, when you're trying to analyze and think through why people do what they do? Well, so my, you know, my biggest takeaway was, first of all, just how sort of miswired we are for all of this. Like, you know, I mean, basically, you know, we couldn't, we couldn't be wired any worse than we are to make good investing decisions. Everything we're wired to do uh, is to sort of be reactionary and short-sighted and weigh information uh, improperly and be excessively emotional. So, you know, becoming a good trader, becoming a good investor uh, is an enormous uphill battle, just kind of given the way that we're put together. Uh, but I think it's possible, but I think it takes holism, right? I mean, I think it takes stuff like uh, you know, you have to train for it a bit like an athlete, like you have to be in shape, you have to eat well, you have to sleep well, you have to control your inputs into your environment, right? Like things like, um, you know, things like how much caffeine and alcohol and things you take in are all predictive of, of the choices you make. Yeah, so I mean, I looked at, you know, there's stuff about, you um, there, there's gender-based differences, right? Like men have more testosterone, which gives them sort of a short-term edge in some respects, but then also there's this sort of curse of winning, right? We see that men who win and win and win and go on a real hot trading streak 
uh, tend to become overconfident and sort of lose their risk controls. And so in nature, we, you know, we observe this in the animal kingdom, we observe it among uh, traders, that people who are on a long winning streak become less and less thoughtful about their risk controls and start to take bigger risks. You know, we re read stuff about, you know, people who are hungry tend to see risk everywhere. We see, uh, you know, there was research about having to pee, actually. There was research about people who have to pee. Uh, actually, there's something called uh, inhibitory spillover. So, you know, the same sort of risk management techniques you're using to not piss your pants you bring into uh, your trading so there's all nice. kinds of, you know there's all kinds of stuff uh you know none of those things in isolation are going to be a big deal right but but taken as a whole you start to you start to think of this again more holistically and that trading and good investment decision making becomes a, a lifestyle right and not just mm. something that occurs in a vacuum i think is the, the big takeaway Got it. Got it. Got it. Yep. I think that's a really, really good aspect. What's one thing that you know, we can easily control immediately to start making changes fastest? Well, if I, you know, when I'm asked for sort of my one piece of advice, it's always to automate, right? Um, there's a, I, I looked at over 200 uh, 200 studies on sort of human discretion uh, versus automation for, for part of the book. And, uh, you know, we found that 94% of the time following a system, you know, like following a methodology, a trading system or whatever, uh, leads you to make better decisions. And so uh, I know this is sort of a, a trading maxim, but you just, you know, there's a million ways to make money in the market, but whatever your sort of particular you know, faith is your faith tradition, you need to have one and you need to stick with it in good times and bad. Uh, because about half the time, uh, you know, about half the time, uh, following an automated process kills human discretion. And the other half of the time, it, it beats it narrowly, very, very seldom does winging it uh, lead to a good decision. So I think, you know, before people start trading, they need to do some serious paper trading and have a very well thought out system that they stick to in good times and bad. Uh, and, you know, perhaps even a coach or a friend or something that will uh, help them stick, stick with that. Yeah. Do you think people are more afraid of losing money or being wrong? Uh, more afraid of losing money or being wrong. Um, so uh, that's an interesting question. One of the things that I found in my book, you looked at um, you looked at sort of excitatory patterns in people's brains, right? When they were confronted with different things like sex, right? Or drugs or uh, losing money or thinking about death, like all these things that sort of elicit a strong emotion in us. Uh, losing money was the biggest excitatory response, more than sex, more than death, more than drugs, like all these things. We're more fearful about losing money uh, than, than just about anything else. Wow. Why? Why is that, you think? Well, I think, I think there's a couple of reasons, right? I think one reason is that um, it becomes a shorthand for, for happiness, right? We've sort of imbued money with this quality of like, it's a it's a sort of a stand-in for our self-worth, it's a stand-in for our happiness and our achievement. And so it has these meta meanings that, um, you know, probably uh, are, are bigger than they should be. But then the other reason is, I mean, you know, one of the things you learn in my book is that we're really just wired for survival, right? And the same way that a caveman didn't want to run out of meat, like we don't want to run out of money. So um, we are never wired to have enough money so like, you know, to the upside, there's basically never enough. Um, and there's this thing called the hedonic treadmill where, you know, you, even as you make more and more money, it's never quite enough. You're never quite there. You keep moving the goalposts. Uh, but to the downside, you can get square, scared really quick. So I think there's, uh, you know, there's sort of uh, primitive survival reasons why we're scared to lose money. And there's also sort of higher level societal reasons why it can be seen as sort of an ego hit or a loss of status or a loss of well-being. Man, that is interesting. I like the term that you used, meta meanings. Can you give us a little bit more description on that? 
Yeah, so meta meaning like it sort of transcends its most basic purpose, right? Like money's most basic purpose is for you and I to transact business and you know get the goods and services that we need to to make it through the day. But clearly, it's a it means a hell of a lot more than that, right? I mean, clearly, it it's a it's a symbol. It's a stand-in for success. It's a stand-in for intelligence. It's a stand-in for achievement and 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 all sorts of things. And so it's the closest thing we have to a barometer for personal worth. And like, that's not as it should be, um, but, but that's kind of how it is. And so there's a, lot, there's a lot loaded into money. And so we lose all that, um, you know, everything from our self-worth to our social standing when we lose money, uh, if we're not careful. Wow. Man, that's really interesting. Because I guess in essence, Dr. Crosby, kind of what you're saying is we do have, I guess my question would be, do we have the ability to internally change that association? Yeah, so the, the, thing, the thing that you need to do, though, one of the things that I found in the book is a lot of times when we're trying to change a behavior, we want to white knuckle it, right? We want to say, oh, you know, money shouldn't have all these meta meanings for me. I want it to be, you know, I want to kind of put it in a box. But until we do that, um, you know, it, it's not enough for us to sort of mentally white knuckle it. We need to change the way that we live, right? So like I live in a neighborhood, um, you know, I live in the, the smallest house in my neighborhood, smallest house in like a, in a very nice neighborhood. And my, you know, my neighbor has a Lamborghini or whatever. <laughs> and so it's like, it's a bad place to live because when I see him, I spend all this time looking up, right? It would be much smarter for me to put myself in a better environment where I'm, you know, surrounded maybe perhaps by people who are more on my level socioeconomically. So, I mean, there's, you know, that's just sort of a silly example. But you need to sort of make the mental shift, but then you need to put yourself in a good place, like physically everything from where you live to the people you surround yourself to the people you communicate with that have similar ideas about money. Uh, you know, uh, it's that old saw about you are the five people you surround yourself with. There really is something to that because we don't have any way. Uh, of objectively comparing ourselves. So what we do is we look around to the people in our surroundings and compare ourselves to them. So make your make make sure you're surrounding uh, yourself with with good folks, folks you want to be compared to. Interesting. I like that. That's a really really good step. And I think that I I mean back in the day, the Millionaire Next Door, you know that book that was really kind of speaking on that level of if you if you want to collect and protect, you know, surround yourself with people, don't live above your means, be in a state where you just are more frugal than excessive as, and as time progresses, just to have enough money to protect yourself and to be able to be extremely flexible and liquid. Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. AJ says, do you read your book on Audible? You have a great voice for it. Oh, it's not my, it's not my book. Uh, no, it's not me reading it on Audible. I had to audition, um, I had to audition people for Audible, which is like the weirdest thing I've <laughs> had to do. <laughs> like a, a voice actor sending me MP3s and like trying to, do you want to go with the guy with the soothing baritone or the British guy who, <laughs> no, who adds 10 IQ points, right? So yeah, anyway. that's cool. That's really cool. Yeah. Interesting to know. What, how did you, how did you study and practice and prep for the writing of this book? So the, the way that I write is um, sort of, I go in with a question, I research it to death, and then I look for themes. So like if, for this book, the question was, you know, sort of what, what are the, um, so what are the pillars of, of financial decision-making holistically, right? From every angle. And so I read everything I can about that. I take copious notes. And then I go through it and I look for sort of, um, you know, sort of pillars, consistent themes. I go, okay, well, I'm, I'm seeing a lot about this and I'm seeing a lot about this. And then I try and organize it into sort of these simplistic um, structures because, bro, I'm from Alabama, so I can't, uh, you know, we got to keep it simple from Alabama. That's one thing we do well. We break it down into its easiest constituent parts. And so that's what I try and do. Take all this good ivory tower stuff. Um, 
break it down, look for themes and try and communicate it to the people in a way that uh, they can hear it and, and, and apply it in their lives. What part of Alabama are you from? I'm from North, uh, I live in Atlanta now, but I, I'm from North Alabama, Huntsville. Oh, nice, man. Cool. I was born in Canton and I live in Nashville, Tennessee. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. I grew up like two hours from Nashville. Great place. Killer. Very killer. So when you apply this to your own investing, has it helped? Have you noticed an absolute change and shift in the way you do what you do? Yeah, so it's it's uh, funny, you know, so sort of the answer is yes and no, right? So, I mean, just from a tactical perspective, there's I'm a better investor for having researched, right? Like I have my own system that just sort of like a long-term value quality momentum approach, but uh, with, you know, sort of medium term holding periods and that's done real well, right? Uh, and that's something that I can believe in, which is uh, I can believe in it and I can stick with it, which is the most important thing. But I mean, I find myself doing stuff that contraindicates my research all the time, right? I mean, uh, you know, do, do athletic trainers, uh, are they tempted to eat Halloween candy? Like probably, right? I mean, I'm, I'm tempted to do stuff I know I shouldn't do all the time. Uh, with respect to markets. And so I think, you know, for me, I, I think you really need three things for behavior change. It's sort of this three E's that I've come up with. The first is education, right? You need to know what the heck you're doing. Uh, the second one is the environment. You need the right portfolio for, for you and your needs and, and your goals, what you're trying to accomplish. And then the third thing is encouragement, right? Whether it's a, a financial advisor or a coach or a community or what, whatever it is. You, you need all these things. You need the know-how, you need the right book, and then you need the right people around you. If you've got all those three things, I think you'll do well, but it, but it takes all three of them because, you know, my favorite, my favorite example of this, U.S. Uh, US started labeling nutrition labels in, in 1993. So since, since 1993, we've, we've all known exactly what we were putting in our body, right? Um, salt, fat, sodium, all that. Um, right. And since that time, the American consumer is twice as fat and three times as morbidly obese because, you know, knowing what to do and doing the right thing are very different conversations, right? <laughs> you know, 40% 40, 40 of people cheat on their spouse. Not a single one of them was like, you know what, this is a good, this is a good plan. Um, <laughs> you know, sure. just, you know, it's, it's a very different thing. So you need, you need the right environment, the right know-how and the right people around you to, to really make those tough changes. Going back to what you mentioned earlier on the money thing, uh, just like a caveman never wants to run out of meat. We never want to run out of money. And therefore, theoretically, we can't ever get to that post where we're like, yep, this is enough. I'm totally comfortable. Is there a spot where humans just always chase happiness or is there a way that we can achieve that bliss that nirvana so when it comes to the research on money and happiness there's a couple of things that are very consistent right there there are some ways that that money does buy happiness and there's some ways that it doesn't so one thing that money does buy happiness up to a certain level right like someone with you know $50,000 a year is happier than someone with $5,000 a year. And you see that trend up about to the point where you're able to take care of your basic needs, right? So uh, money does buy happiness up to the point where you can live in a safe house, send your kids to a nice school, you know, have enough to eat, go on a vacation. Like money does buy happiness up to that point. Uh, after that, it flatlines pretty fast. And then after that point, you see money buys happiness in just a few predictable ways, right? You see money buys happiness uh, when you spend it on other people, right? When you're kind and generous and charitable with your money, that's one way that it buys happiness. You see money buys happiness when you use it to spend time with people you love, right? When you make memories, go on a vacation, something like that. And then the third thing is money buys happiness when you use it to get you out of stuff that you hate. So if you hate whatever, painting your house, mowing your yard, cleaning your house, sort of whatever, if there's something you really, really dislike, um, money buys you happiness um, by sort of freeing you of tasks that really rob you of joy. So mm. um, that's, you know, it, it's, it's just about spending money smartly, getting to a point where you can you know, really enjoy life and then, and then spending it smartly and, and, you know, lending a hand to people uh, who need a little help up the ladder. 
I like that, man. That's really, really interesting. I dig it. So what, what's that number? Is it like uh, 75,000, 60,000 where it kind of starts flatlining? Is that about where it is? Something like that? Yeah. So someone, I saw someone in the comments said 75 and that's right. That's from a Princeton study that was done and it, it, it does tick up incrementally, right? It does tick up incrementally after 75, but it's very, very flat. Like the, the curve is very steep up to 75 yep. and starting at about 75, it gets awfully flat because, you know, 75 grand a year, um, 75 grand a year, you can, you can, you know, in most places provide. Well, just do whatever you want to an extent. Yeah. Basics yeah. Of, of life, right? Yep. Yep, exactly. I mean, you can't, you can't do all the things that you want lavishly, but you can more or less, I mean, 75K, you have everything you'll need. Bills, yeah. food, house, all that jazz, and a little extra to do stuff with. Yeah. You know, is there ever a point where you have diminishing returns on the money? No, just, uh, that's not, uh, that's not suggested in the research, but then, uh, then it comes, uh, you know, then it comes to how you spend it, I think, because I think there's, there's plenty of miserable people you know, I've seen some great programming on on sort of the curse of lottery winners and stuff, but they they spend it poorly, right? They're not spending it in the ways that I talked about. They're they're being foolish with it, and so I think money can definitely uh, become a complicating factor. But that's you know, it's kind of up to you at that point. Like, are mm -hmm. you going to spend it on you know, are you going to spend it on uh, on on Lambos and bad choices? Or are you going to spend it on um, you know, providing a nice life for your family and, and helping out others? Yeah, got it. That's a really good advice. And uh, Lambos and bad choices. <laughs> that's the name. That's going to be the name of my autobiography. Lambos. Yeah. Bad <laughs> this is where it went downhill, team. This is it. <laughs> oh it's too funny i love ma'am what is your advice on how someone can be in a trade longer because that's one of the biggest challenges for many investors traders people who are in the markets is they do hit a hot hand they hit a hot sock how do they hold it longer so i mean i think there's two there's two easy ways one is to have a system right i mean there have been many many times i've wanted to exit a position and i haven't just because my you know my my algorithm told me not to right and so i think having having a system having a plan and sticking with it i think is one way and then the other way that's proven it's like unsexy but just looking at it less i mean there is a there's a direct correlation between, uh, you know, between looking at a position and trading a position. And, you know, one of the reasons why women ha tend to outperform men uh, in most investing tasks, both, both at a retail level and professionally, is because they just mess with it less, you know, so they're just not, um, you know, they're just not watching that, uh, watching that pot all the time. So I think, I think having a system is the, the most powerful way but there's, uh, you know, there's something to just distraction and, and getting on with your life. Yeah. Having the, having those rules or some type of basis for what you do and why you do it. Yeah. So this is a good question came in on the chat pane. Any advice on recognizing the mood you are waking up on and deciding to trade or, you know, to be in the markets based on that? Yeah. So that's, that's an excellent question. So one of the most surprising uh, things that I found in my research is that we lose 13% uh, of our IQ uh, when we're under duress, right? When we're under stress, we lose 13% of our IQ. And, you know, look, man, I went to Alabama public schools. I don't have an extra 13% hanging around. So I need every bit of that. And so there is something to, you know, take, taking a day off. Or you know, sitting one out if you're not in in peak uh, peak condition. So, uh, the, you know, uh, periods of high emotion really do two things to us. One, they make us stupid, right? So I talked about that a bit, but they also make us strangers to our rules. So um, Dan Ariely, the behavioral economist, has this great research about um, trying to stop the the spread of STDs. So we're going into Lambos and bad choices territory here. But, here we go. <laughs> you know, he's, he's, he's trying to talk, you know, he's like, look, people, people know what to do to, to stop the transmission of, of sexually transmitted illness. So what, you know, why don't they do it? 
And he basically tested people in two states, right? You know, he said, hey, um, people in sort of what we'll call a cold emotional state, you know, just someone who's just gotten out of class or whatever, I get out of your accounting class and you take a quiz on, you know, preventing, uh, preventing STDs and they know exactly what to do. You know, you use protection, you, you safe, you don't cheat on your partner, you know, all that yada yada. They, they know exactly what to do. Then they had a second group and they showed them pornography, right? They showed them, they got them in an excited emotional state. And then they said, hey, uh, take this quiz. And people were bonkers, right? Like people lost their minds. People didn't know what to do anymore. So um, it makes you a stranger to your rules, emotion of any kind. Um, there's, a, there's an acronym, there's an acronym in the addiction, like the 12 step programs that's called HALT, like H-A-L-T. Okay. And it says hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. And it says never, basically never make a big life decision when you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. And, you know, or fill in your emotion of choice. And I think that uh, traders would be wise to, to adopt a similar acronym for themselves. I'm jotting that down. HALT. Yeah. Cause that, I mean, it makes sense. Like if you feel one of those, don't do anything. Right. Yeah, get, it out. get it out. Yeah. Yep. That's good. That's good info, man. Thank you. Um, yeah. that's very, very useful. And if anyone else has any questions, obviously feel free to throw it in there and, uh, let us know. But I mean, in general, when you're going through these instances and these practices, I mean, that's again, journaling can help picking a day, understanding what you're doing, because we all have these things that are thrown at us, diets, lifestyle changes, way to eat, eating regimens. You also do want to test and tweak and see what's really good for your body. You don't want to just do crazy, crazy, intense things all the time and just kind of figure out like at, after you're finished what worked and what didn't. But you have to realize, yeah, if you do perform badly and you are full and you do have a bad trading day and it didn't work, what are the reasons? Kind of back trade it, back test it, and go in reverse almost kind of see what worked after the fact and then just document it, right? Yeah, so there's an interesting point I'll, I'll piggyback off there. So we know from the research that um, we have sort of a, a, a finite amount of willpower, right? So people, it's been shown that people who are exercising restraint in one area uh, tend to, to buckle in other areas. So, um, you know, people who are on a diet you know, are, are, you know, you're exercising a lot of mental strength and a lot of restraint to eat healthily and avoid bad foods and things. And so those people are more likely to sort of show, uh, you know, snap at their kids, cheat on their partner, whatever, like, you know, have, have lapses in willpower elsewhere. And so uh, we see that a lot, right? So you have to think about, right, again, it's, we, we're this unified system, it's all working in concert. So be careful, right? When you're trying to make big changes, um, realize that whatever changes you're trying to make in your personal life or, you know, even the way you eat or the way you sleep or the way you live, that's going to have, uh, you know, that's going to have an impact on your trading. That's going to have an impact on your thinking and take it easy. The most, uh, the most powerful behavioral change happens incrementally. So what mm -hmm. you want to do is you want to set that goal you want to subdivide the goal right into sort of 10 or five or 10 sort of smaller chunks uh, and start working on the smallest iteration of that goal possible instead of you know trying to kill yourself swinging for the fences the first time yep that's a massive one man that's a huge one because humans myself you everyone like we want it immediately <laughs> whatever yeah. it is inherently because then we would have it for sure so we want it like right now. It doesn't matter what it is, money, success, happiness, a six pack. It's like, I would like it now, please. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, instant gratification. I think it's, yeah. The, the small, small goals, chunking it down into the tiny bite-sized chunks, right? How That's how the best way to eat an elephant. Mm -hmm. So yeah, no, I love that. I love that. Um, someone had a question. Let's see if I can scroll up. People are loving the, the chat, by the way. So thank you. Um, Thomas says, what's a good way to reset your mindset if you think it is compromised? Hmm. So uh, I would have you look into uh, something called cognitive behavioral therapy. This is all about this, right? So cognitive behavioral therapy sort of follows this. They have some cool workbook, work 
workbooks, workbooks and stuff um, that'll help walk you through this. But it follows this ABC model, right? So the A is for activating belief, uh, or excuse me, activating event. The B is for belief and the C is for consequence, right? So a lot of people believe that you go straight from A to C, right? So if something bad happens to you, there is necessarily a bad consequence. But what uh, cognitive behavioral therapy says is, look, there's this intervening moment with the beliefs, the story you tell yourself, and that, uh, that's where you intervene, right? If you can tell yourself a different story, if you can challenge those irrational thoughts, if you can think more systematically, more coherently, more mathematically, then you're gonna arrive at better conclusions, right? And so this is an, a, a really empowering thing. And it's a whole, it's the most empirically supported form of, of psychological treatment. It's great for sort of, you know, what I'll call um, the worried well, you know, people, people like me who uh, are just a little crazy, right? So this yeah. is, this is a, a really powerful uh, thing. So check out some books and especially some workbooks on, um, cognitive behavioral therapy and that ABC model and learn how to really reset that B. Yeah. Reset the B, <laughs> the beliefs. That's going to be like my new, that's going to be my new motto. So, yeah, I mean, as far as your profession, Dr. Crosby, what do you, what do you do exactly? I mean, do you, uh, are you like a physical therapist where you sit people down talk to them or is it, is it books? Is it studying? Is it just your, you make a lot of money investing? How does that work on your side? Yeah. So I actually, I actually work for uh, a, a firm called Bringer Capital that manages uh, well now we just, we just merged with another firm. So we have about 50 billion. So I work with a, um, you know, a, a mutual fund manager, an ETF manager, and I help uh, financial advisors help their clients to make better choices. So we're mm. about half of the house is tech, half of the house is asset management. So I have a jobby job in addition to writing books and things like that. So yeah, that's, that's what I do. Cool. So you just kind of show up and go, Hey, calm down. <laughs> yeah. I've been, uh, been doing a lot of that this morning as it turns out. Yeah. <laughs> Relax. I yeah. sat by a I sat by a woman on a plane once, and she asked me what I did, and I told her, and she's like, "You went to eight years of college to tell people to buy low and sell high." I was like, "Yeah, when you put it that way." Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, buy low and then wait and then sell high. That's the part you forgot. That's the part that you tell people. Right. The waiting. The waiting is the hard piece. I love it. So Lade has a question. He says. Dr. Crosby, when you lose a passion from a former creative career into a new passion, such as trading, how does one justify the things of security like insurance, steady paycheck, and a pension? So um, let me make sure I'm understanding the question. So you moved from a previous passion and, and now have a passion for trading, and you're wanting to know how do you kind of like secure the basics of, of you know, a steady paycheck and insurance? Yep. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that I, I think that one uh, one thing that's important to, to know is that you need to be okay. Rewind. Trading is an uphill battle, right? Uh, trading is an uphill battle. Not many people are good at it, right? It's tough. It's psychologically demanding. It it makes you do many of the things that humankind does worse like uh, embrace uncertainty, embrace volatility, you know, and live with all of these things. That's nothing the human family does well. So I think that's best done from a place of security, um, whether that security is, you know, adequate money in the bank to make it through a, you know, a, a learning curve, whether that's a, a day job that allows you to trade on the side, whatever that is, I think you need to build that firm foundation. It goes back to our HALT model, right? Um, I think if you don't have some semblance of security, uh, you know, that foundation built, you're always going to be trading scared and you're always, uh, yeah, you're always going to be playing catch up. And I worry that that's not a, a great place to be. So I think that whatever that looks like for you, and it'll look different for every person, um, I think it's important to have peace of mind there because there's candidly very little peace of mind to be had in markets. And so I think if you, if you can't get sort of your house in order, you're, you're going to struggle 
um, yeah. you know, in, in what is an inherently uncertain occupation. Yep. It's, you have to find certainty in other aspects of life. That's right. Not just, not this one, because <laughs> you, there are aspects of certainty, but they're not a lot. They're not vast. Yeah. I love that. Okay. Last question. Maybe <laughs> if people are on the verge of, you mentioned earlier, the happiness at work where they can leave their job and be happy or doing something else that they want to, or if they have enough money, they can avoid doing things that they dislike doing. How do people make the shift in their mind from the golden handcuffs? I get paid a lot of money here but I don't like it. And I would rather do X, Y, Z and also trade on the side and make less money, but be happier. How do people make that shift? So I think, you know, it goes back to the sort of the meta narrative around money. I think we need to measure what matters, right? I think a lot of people uh, play a one dimensional life game, which is, you know, my life is as good or as bad as my paycheck. And that's a really sort of pitiful way to look at life. So mm -hmm. there's a cool model. Um, there's a cool model by a gentleman by the name of Dar Dr. Martin Seligman at the U University of Pennsylvania, and it's called the PERMA model. And so he looked at sort of what makes people happy. And it's, uh, you know, the P is for positive emotion. That's like fun, you know? So like, am I having just sort of lighthearted, make you smile fun in my life? Uh, the E is for engagement. Am I doing deep work that I find meaningful, right? Like not stupid meetings and stuff, but like work that is immersive, that makes me lose track of time. Uh, the R is for relationships, which is just what it sounds like. Probably the single best predictor of happiness is, you know, whether we have, um, you know, surrounded by people who care about us. Uh, the M is for meaning. Are we doing something that is bigger than us, right? Whether that is charitable giving or religion or spirituality or philanthropy, whatever. Like, are we getting outside of ourselves? Uh, and the A is for advancement. Like, are we getting, you know, are we better today than we were yesterday? So that's the right yardstick for life, right? Uh, am I surrounded by people I love? Am I working for something bigger? Am I getting better? Am I having fun? Am I doing good work? That's like, to me, the right yardstick for life, not a paycheck. So uh, you realizing too, what we talked about earlier, you'll never have enough money ever, ever, ever. I mean, I've, I've written three books about this stuff and I have blown past every yardstick, every time I set a num number for myself and I pass it, I go, you know, this is the number when I, you know, really have arrived. And every time I pass it, it's a complete non-event. So, you know, knowing that about yourself, knowing that you're not wired for sufficiency and just finding a new yardstick is I think an important way to, to sort of change the narrative uh, around money. Because mm, the yardstick can be something else, right? It doesn't have to directly be money. It could be sure. if you're like, okay, cool. I got $14 million, badass. Now let me go run a marathon. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, you are an acronym machine, man. <laughs> Listen, eight years of college to drop acronyms on your head all day. Bro, acronym beast, man. I love it. I love it. But that's a really good one. Um, perma bull, you know, because I always uh, there you go. I always describe myself as a per perma bull, but positive engagement, relationships, meaning and advancement. And I think a lot of those, if if you're not truly happy, in your work or in your life and you know it and i normally classify that by telling people if you wake up and hit the alarm and the first thing that you say in your mind is a cuss word you should probably start figuring out a way to go do something else <laughs> right you know like that that's the sign that's the signal like you should be waking up without the alarm kind of excited about it relatively speaking and, and you might be sore your body might be sore but at least you're not like hating life at least you're kind of pumped up about doing whatever it is that you're doing so yeah, man, I love it. Um, the behavioral investor, Dr. Daniel Crosby, man, thank you for being on the show, dude. I really appreciate your time today. Yeah, my, my pleasure. Good luck, everyone. Um, hopefully we'll have some more certainty here in a few, few minutes about what's going on in our country and uh, happy trading to everybody. Yeah. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate your time. Right on. Bye. Killer. There you go, team. Learning stuff every day. 
Love it. Love it. Love it. While we are here on the recording, let's just go ahead and update some trades. So we did get stopped. That'll be on me. Degenerate. And then Tesla is trying to bounce, which is nice. So what we'll do, uh, I, I did cancel the AMD trade. So that one's, that one's canceled. So you can just cancel that one. HYLN doesn't look disastrously awful. Trying this one a second time on the day. And the 15 minute chart still looks okay. Um, it is in a, what I would refer to as some type of consolidation, a little bit of a pennant pattern. So if it decides to break, it could work. Um, it's only up 6%, it has a very high short float. It's a possibility, it's one of those that maybe could start moving. So I'm gonna increase the stop on that very soon. And then Tesla, I think best case scenario on Tesla, we're gonna go ahead and increase the stop again, but it does, seem like this one also will not work. So if we're given the opportunity to exit for a small gain uh, and just again, have a loss on the day, uh, I'll probably do that, but it'll be some, it will be a small loss. At least Tesla took a few hits off the 420 line and then ended up bouncing. That makes everyone feel better. All right, so stop 418.94 on Tesla. Okay, increasing stop loss on Tesla. So I got that one bumped up beyond me. We got stopped out, lame. And then HYLN, uh, I'm just gonna try to be patient for another few minutes. Again, if we can get that R back um, on it from earlier, we lost on beyond me. If I win small or lose small on Tesla, most likely just be a small losing day for day trades. Obviously, if you're in something bullish and you own something, congrats, uh, because you're probably up on it, most likely. So should be intriguing to see what happens overall. Uh, so anyway, yeah, if you're listening to the recording and watching this video, thank you for being here. I appreciate your time. Make sure to hit that subscribe button. More interviews on the way. Yeah.